Okay, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you uh, very much for coming to this mini conference on the Black Commons. My name is Colin Yeager. I teach in the English department at Rutgers University, and I also direct the Center for Cultural Analysis here. Every year, the CCA sponsors a year-long seminar on a theme or topic of interdisciplinary importance. This year, our theme is the Commons, uh, and this mini conference on the Black Commons is our first public event. The idea for today's gathering really began last year when we read Kofi Boone's co-authored article, Is It Time to Look Again at the Black Commons? It touched on matters that seem so very topical, but that also stretch back to the past and forward into the way we imagine the future. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could foster a conversation across disciplinary lines that would push the idea of the Black Commons in new directions? And we're so pleased that that initial thought has brought our four guests here today. Yeah, my name is Kofi Boone. I teach landscape architecture. It's a bit of an obscure profession, but today, uh, which would be a big celebration in our particular part of the world. But you know what we talk about with regards to Central Park is uh, there were self-built communities in the footprint of Central Park before it was developed. Uh, in particular, Seneca Village, a self-built African-American community that was home to about 900 people. As a part of the development of Central Park, not only was that community completely erased, but uh, although Olmsted was an abolitionist uh, and had uh, certain proclivities, uh, he did not hire African-Americans and did not consider African-Americans equal to white people. So embedded in sort of the popularization of our profession in America, the popularization of landscape architecture is this issue of race and contested values about resources, and land and wealth. And the article that uh, Colin referred to was co-written by a good friend and colleague, Julian Edgemond is at Tufts. Uh, he's a planner uh, by training, but we both focus on this issue of environmental justice and issues of sustainability and environmental equity. And it was really interesting in the time of the uprising that occurred in the summer of 2020, the kinds of things that people were talking about in terms of, you know, inching towards that whole conversation of reparations, but at least a critical review of our past to figure out how these uh, chronic, uh, cyclical, uh, sort of repeating incidents of racial violence uh, can be addressed systematically. But what we didn't hear was the role of land and wealth and property in black communities as a part of that conversation and how to also use that moment to advance those particular issues. And as an anecdote, uh, George Floyd, of course, uh, murdered brutally uh, in Minneapolis, but was a native of Houston, Texas, and went to a high school named after Jack Yates. And among Jack Yates' great accomplishments uh, in terms of founding a church and many other things that are really extraordinary for Houston's uh, historic black community uh, developed a coalition of people to invest in acquiring property in 1872 and build Emancipation Park. And the whole intent of Emancipation Park at that time in Houston was to celebrate Juneteenth, you know, a holiday that was invented by black people in Texas once they heard years later uh, about uh, emancipation. So Emancipation Park predates any public park in Houston. The first park in Houston was a park owned and developed by Black people to celebrate Black cultural uh, uh, legacy. Uh, and so we tried to latch on to that idea and say that, well, part of this is really about uh, in a racial capitalist system, uh, these elements that empower and engender Black people to, to property and wealth development through the land. And that led to a journey of retracing the steps of where that's occurred in the past. There's an excellent book called Collective Courage uh, by Jessica Nemhart that really talks about the legacy of black cooperatives. Uh, and everyone at the, after reconstruction, the, the really the tragic end of reconstruction, reclamation in 1877, black communities didn't stop trying to acquire property, acquire wealth or acquire power. Uh, everyone from W.B. Du Bois to Booker T. Washington to many others really celebrated the use of, of cooperative ownership as a way to lift people uh, out of poverty, build wealth, and build land. And in our own backyard, I'm calling from Raleigh, North Carolina, Durham, 
North Carolina was home to another Black Wall Street, the one that wasn't destroyed in Tulsa, uh, but one that was founded by NC Mutual Life Insurance Company, as well as Mechanics and Farmers Bank, who collectively employed more Black people in the United States than any other company until the 1960s. So this lasting legacy of collective ownership has been central uh, to other projects, the political project and other projects that we face. You know, on the other end, uh, dealing with the South, uh, people like Fannie Lou Hamer and the Freedom Farms of Mississippi and the innovation of the pig bank, which we now know as the DNA of everything from micro lending internationally, uh, but then evolved by the Shoemaker Center and the, the codification of community land trusts as a mechanism for enabling uh, collective ownership of land in the interest of maintaining uh, collective goals outside of the, the capitalist project in terms of real estate value uh, and the popularization of it, right? Coming from the seeds of how do we continue and extend the civil rights, modern civil rights legacy into economic and wealth development means. And really the term, the black commons, we borrowed from the Schumacher Center because this is a proposal that they made uh, about two years ago in terms of uh, uh, people buying land for contribution to a collective nationwide index of uh, community land trust owned land with the interest of uh, providing affordability and sort of a ground uh, for people to build uh, their own uh, levels and dimensions of wealth. One of the most celebrated urban uh, community land trusts uh, is in our own backyard as well, the Durham Community Land Trust, uh, but also the Dudley Street Initiative uh, sort of the brainchild of Mel King uh, in Boston at a time when Roxbury was not uh, a part of the booming part of the city of Boston that we know today. But going in before that wave to uh, negotiate with the city to acquire a critical mass of property uh, for the interest of maintaining stability and strengthening communities there. And even in a modern sense has been resistant to gentrification and displacement even during COVID-19. Uh, those properties and those lands have not been uh, 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 areas where gentrification has sort of uprooted communities. It's actually had the opposite effect. Uh, so part of the article was about dealing with these components, right? So this legacy coming from the era of reconstruction, we do go further. We talk about, uh, you know, great writing, describing uh, people commenting even in the midst of plantations and enslavement, right? That people finding ways to from passing seeds or, or grounds for uh, celebrating rituals or other things that occurred in that state, but we're really dealing with more of the, the contemporary era and suggesting that that should be back on the table as a component of, along with the political project, uh, the land and the property project. You'll hear from other people and I'll wrap it up here because I'm, I'm at 10 minutes. Um, uh, black land loss is, is, is an incredible uh, phenomenon uh, well-documented in rural areas, poorly documented in urban areas, which I think is a future project is, is tracking how an urban areas uh, land loss was done. But if you just calculate the land loss uh, from rural areas from 1924, you're talking about a trillion dollars in land value uh, that is gone, uh, that's not available. And even with Pigford cases one and two and many others, uh, we have not had a reconciliation or a restoration of those of those uh, that lost land and what that wealth and land and property control could have done uh, to help us with building institutions, protecting health, uh, developing a lot of the systems that we think are, are shown to be ragged and fractured uh, in the pandemic era. So today I want to focus my brief comments on global territories and transnational histories to remind us of the urgency to frame our analyses on Black anti-racism struggles globally. I welcome this um, opportunity to discuss my ongoing research on the racial and gendered logics of urban Black land loss and to share my personal intellectual and political preoccupation with disseminating knowledge about a segment of the African diaspora that most often ignored Blacks in Latin America and those who occupy the margins of the margins in the region, Black women. With a black, pop, with a black population in Latin America, that surpasses 100 million and more than 3 million being displaced from their lands in Colombia, Brazil, and Ecuador, for example, I find it encouraging that we are working to invert 
the geography of our collective reasoning and on the insidious nature of anti-Black capitalist, capitalist driven genocide that is deeply gendered. From North America to the Southern coast, the Black land heist um, necessarily informs our diasporic discussions on the afterlife at, of settler colonialism and slavery and the ongoing permutations of racist ideas and practices. It is fascinating when we reread W.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction and the original constitution of the Haitian Revolution of 1805, we can see just how much land was emphasized in the formulation of freedom and decolonization. So in my research, I've been preoccupied with emphasizing how and why Black women are the main political protagonist protagonists mobilizing at the grassroots against forced um, removals and for police abolition, um, sometimes putting their bodies in front of bulldozers and the military police. I've shown, in, um, I've shown in my work how poor Black women have been ignored in this scholarship on urban policy, design, um, land, and social movements um, in Brazil in general. So who's seen as a protester, who's, understand, who's understood as a political theorist, or even a policymaker? I take these questions a step further and illustrate that these women operating on the margins of the margins have been organizing mass social movements in recent decades that challenge gendered racism pervasive at all levels of Brazilian society, including among leftist activists who ignore the genocidal underpinnings of the demolitions and militarized policing of Black urban spaces. I'm profoundly guided by the ideas of Black feminist scholar activists, such as the late Louisa Bajos, Claudia Jones, and Tony K. Bambara, who have taught, it, taught us that we need to return our social, scientific, and humanistic studies to the real material issues that concern the lives of the marginalized poor. My research on Black women's activism shows that Black spaces are racialized to reigns of, of domination in which women's politics are deeply connected to resistance against geogra geographic domination as practices enforce removals and land dispossession. Hence, I understand the loss of land, specifically an expansive understanding of territory that also includes water to be a key Black feminist issue today. The kind of issue that informed Black feminist thought in the first place and well before Black feminists, or Black feminism or Black feminist thought took hold in gender and Black studies. My work is about the struggle for land and water for everyday survival, but also a geographic preoccupation of African descendant peoples in the diaspora with spatial belonging resonating with Dion Brand's provocation with a um, um, preoccupation with a certain kind of landing, claiming space and permanence. Land becomes important in the struggle for citizenship and freedom, not for its market value as Kofi Boone just stated, but, um, or for material possession, but for its psychic significance. Listening to these gut-wrenching interviews of Haitian migrants, um, um, they, express, they express how tired they are actually of moving. This emphasis on Black women include well-known thinkers and activists, as well as the many unknown women who stand on the front lines of justice every day, oftentimes already having, um, all, having already sacrificed their sons and daughters to the violence and subsequently themselves as political actors, actors against pervasive, against pervasive um, racial impunity. Another key piece of my own work um, includes the Black women researchers, which um, touches upon, uh, which I touch upon in the article. Um, this includes Catherine Dunnan, um, Angela Gillian, Tony K. Bambara, and more recently, Asseli Angela Johnny, who have done the not so glamorous work of documenting, archiving, and writing about this violence and the activism that has, um, that has taken place across diaspora communities. These ethnographers um, have been key to building Black studies, but are oftentimes left out of these our own foundational classes and understanding of what preoccupies us um, in our collective um, imaginations. So for me, this also includes um, nurse um, Iraci Isabel da Silva, who at the age of 45, um, um, who died at the age of 45 from a heart attack after defending her grandson during a routine military police invasion of the Gamboa de Baixo neighborhood, right as I started this research in the early 2000s. The 2000s. It was Dona Iraci, and some people say, who's Dona Iraci? <laughs> She's important, trust me. It was Dona Iraci, one of the most, uh, one of the fiercest Black women warriors in the Gamboa de Baixo um, neighborhood um, who fought against coastal evictions and for collective land rights. 
but it was she who told me that I could not understand urban redevelopment and forced displacement without thinking seriously about police abuse. She explained precisely how police violence and racial terror work in tandem with mass eviction. Partly, um, I go into a long discussion drawing from even folks like Patricia Collins to talk about how domestic workers, by virtue of their not just social economic location, but their spatial uh, uh, traversing of these luxury spaces on an everyday, give them a particular understanding of how racial capitalism works in um, cities undergoing rapid redevelopment. Um, in essence, I'm constantly reminded that it is oftentimes poor Black women workers with little firm, formal education who live and die in the poorest neighborhoods who are leading conversations about the genocidal nature of the simultaneous disappearance of Black people and spaces in cities. What lessons can we as scholars in Black and feminist studies or in humanity and social scientists learn from the Ana Cristinas, the Donaira C's, and the Ritas, uh, Rita Barbosa's about the complexity of race, racism, Blackness, and anti-Blackness, for example, or even diaspora? As Sylvia, and one, I should say, as Sylvia Winter encourages, encourages us, as we imagine the Black commons, we need to beware of reproducing liminal categories in our processes of knowledge production and make visible the gender dimension, dimensions of anti-Black class-based racism. Two, Black women anthropologists doing ethnographic research have long challenged us to invert the geography of reason, Ch um, changing, our, starting, um, geograph changing our, our geographic starting point when it comes to the diaspora. This continues to be crucial for incorporating the vastness of Black diasporic experiences, ideas, and politics um, into our, our definition of the Black collective. And this requires travel and language acquisition. Three, um, this attention to the kinds of militancy that emerging from the margins, specifically from Black women workers, mobilizing on the margins um, uh, of Brazil and across the Black diaspora, brings new meaning to the future of the left in North America. For example, knowledge produced by Afro-Brazilian scholar activists, especially recent critiques of the left, including in the emergence of re-emergence of Lula as a candidate for president in 2022, necessarily um, expands our critiques of gendered racial capitalism um, globally. So I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to um, continuing the conversation and any questions. Uh, I'm going to start off our presentation today and then um, turn to my friend and collaborator, Dr. Cameron Carter. So um, here we go. Uh, we enter this conversation on the Black Commons through our studying together around questions of sovereignty and gathering, of critiques of property and its attendant operation, self-regulation as theorized through the interdisciplinary fields of Black studies, Black feminist thought, Black performance studies, and Black religious thought within which you're trained. In some ways, we'd long been asking about the outside in our discrete writings as it undulates against enclosure, be it enclosures wrought by fences, by whiteness, by notions of state-sanctioned rationality and able-mindedness, the violences of gentrification manifest in planned cities churches and universities. We were soon reading together and thinking our conversations were errant roaming. Some mornings we text back and forth about the story of Genesis, <clears throat> creativity and an original unacclosable darkness in the Bible. Lines like quote, held but not had from Nathaniel Mackey's poetry. The idea of refugitivity offered within Gail Jones's literature and the reach of a different Genesis narrative of what Fred Moten calls inseparability, blooming across Wangechi Mutu's canvases. We were re revisiting books like Saidiya Hartman's Scenes of Subjection and thinking about Hartman's writings on Black outsideness, archival, narratological, and otherwise, along with what has been brilliantly described and elaborated by scholar curator J.T. Rowan as, quote, Black ecologies, end quote. We wondered aloud about a lot, about the ethereal in Du Bois' Souls of Black Folk, about the phenomena of Black outdoors in the postbellum era, described by Hartman in scenes where Black gatherings were, <clears throat> were called seditious, and how Enlightenment astronomers also used the word sedition to talk about the wind. And as we talked, we enjoyed so much of this being together, this thinking together, that we wanted to hold a conversation like it if we could which soon became Black Outdoors, 
humanities futures after property and possession. The Franklin Humanities Center in conjunction with the Mellon Foundation made grant monies available for initiatives organized around the idea of humanities futures. Our series um, and eventual, our, our speaker series and eventual book series, I wanted to plug that, <laughs> um, as our white paper illuminates, moved out of our desire to be in conversation with scholars thinking about the black outdoors writ large. That is to say the people that were part of the speaker series component engaged the black outdoors as a modality of geographic, juridical, racial, sexual, economic, and poetic social life. These scholars, Fred Moten, Saidia Hartman, Tiffany Lathabo King, Sora Han, Mercy Romero, Ashan Crawley, Emnerbezi Phillip, Nate Mackey, and Ed Roberson, to come back to the purposes of our conversation today, might be said to have engaged the Black Commons as a city bus, as a stanza of poetry, as forced labor, the textures and corners of a colonial map, an anti-colonial alphabet, a love letter, a prayer. On the one hand, the commons gets defined ecologically and economically speaking as resources shared, what is held in common. Against the notion of property or of presumptive earthly givingness, addressing such an idea of the commons, our series might be said to have asked, what if the commons, in line with Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's work on the undercommons, was about being together otherwise? In the context of Black study for Harney and Moten, this shows up in what they describe as the future, um, quote, future anteriority, end quote, of the classroom with teaching as a modality of prophetic organization. That's a quote. A building of community that never arrives because it's never complete, always futural, always unfinished. For me, Sarah, <laughs> my name in parentheses for some reason, in my work, um, which includes my new book, Black Gathering, yay, I put it yay in parentheses too. <laughs> I've been thinking about um, pages and canvases as places of deregulated togetherness, as places of arrival and departure, not always shared, but that flourish perhaps through unslash commoning. I'm particularly interested in the commons on the page or the uncommons on a page, a page which might be a perch, a place of terror, a page where there's a terrible house, a page where commonness and uncommonness arrive together without explanation, without category or enclosure. My book in some ways asks about the complicated relation between gathering and commoning and modalities of Black artistic praxis that elucidate the sometimes non-alignment between the two. This might happen through abstraction, but sometimes it happens in an author's dream or with an unshareable vision held by a character. I think when authors like Gail Jones create characters that drift into the partially revealed togetherness in a dream, that happens in a book, which is in many books. Well, there are resources there. There's a commoning even if it's not shared necessarily with another person in the same space and time. There are resources nonetheless. There's an offering and a receiving for the viewer who maybe also sees themselves in the gathering on the wall or on the page. In this way, the logic of something held in common or of resources being offered and shared in commoning is complicated by the unknowable sustenance that arrives in uncommoning in what characters keep and not share. And now I'm going to turn to my friend, Dr. Carter. Um, I'd like to add to the brilliance um, that Sarah so wonderfully brings out in her um, invitation, um, so to speak, into the book that she's just finished, Black Gathering, um, by um, only saying that my own work in thinking with her as a comrade in thought has been to try to think about, shall we say, the religious registers, or to be a bit more precise, what I often like kind of call the para-religious registers in which Black gathering, in which Black commoning or Black undercommoning takes place. I'm interested in the para-religiosity of the arts, um, the poetics, the poesis, the semiotics, um, R.A. Judy might say, the parasemiotics of Black commoning, undercommoning, Black gathering, in the sense that Sarah's just been talking about, what I also think of under the inspiration of Nathaniel Mackey, he himself 
being under the inspiration of a certain Rastafarianism, what he calls churchicality, and what I kind of play and amplify and call dark churchicality, this gathering in a kind of dispersion, dispersal as an alternative practice. Um, and I'll talk about this hopefully as we, you know, some more as we go along, an alternative practice, shall we say, of sacrality, which as such is an office of social. And that itself needs to be thought of as an alternative way of thinking about the earth as such. Um, church etymologically from the Greek word ekklesia is a compound term composed of the prefix ek, um, which also has, you know, comes into our transliteration with the prefix ex as an exit um, from ek and then klesia, that second part of the word klesia as a gathering, um, a kind of sociality, a social unit. And so we might think of ecclesia, um, not just in a kind of ecclesiastical sense in which this word gets kind of like locked into a sort of certain kind of church dogmatic thinking, but we can loosen it from that. It simply as ecclesia means those who have been gathered in their outness, ek, out, ecclesia, um, black commoning, black gathering as an alternate imagination of churchicality, of being gathered in our outings, out from what? Out from what Cedric Robinson might call the reigning terms of order. That outness, in other words, Sarah and I have called outdoors, black outdoors. Um, that outness is outside um, in its non-binary opposition to an inside. That outness is just that, out, out from property, out from the logic of, and here I'm inflecting poet Ed Roberson, out from the logic of world as imposed on top of the earth, the practice of black comedy, of black gathering, again staying with Roberson, is the aesthetic para-religious practice of dwelling with the earth, being with the earth um, before the end of the world. That outness in this sense, again, is then ecstatic, another kind of play on the ek word, ecstatic, Black commoning as a practice of ecstasy, the Black ecstatic. These are issues that I take up in my forthcoming book, The Anarchy of Black Religion, a mystic song, which is currently in impress and should be out next year, as well as in the follow-up text from this um, titled The Religion of White an apocalyptic lyric. My modest proposal for our consideration here is that at stake in what Sarah has wonderfully called Black gathering and in, 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 in what is here in our mini conference here being called Black commons is in fact an alternate imagination of the sacred or what we might think of after in Jackie Alexander as an alternate imagination of the ineffable or after George Bataille, the excessive. And by excessive, Bataille beautifully means that which is base or of the earth in its most fundamental way. At stake is another mode of questing and questioning towards some other sacrality, but a sacrality that is not premised on sacrifice, a sacrality that is without capitalist logics that oppose life and death and in a racially gendered way parcel out white, white, uh, life and death. Um, a form of sacrality that's not premised on ecologic, shall we say, of property and extraction, a mode of the sacred and an imagination of matter beyond settler genres thereof. I want to understand what is called in our conversation then the Black Commons as a theory. And I mean this almost in that kind of ancient sense of theoria, um, a practice of study and contemplation, a theory of the earth. Black commons or black commoning or blackness as commoning, in short, black study is not a thinking about the earth as our object, which is then just at the epistemic level, another practice of property, our object, my object um, that is imagined as something static and brought them within my purview of epistemic ownership. Against that kind of anthropocentrism, or more precisely against that mode of 
humanocentrism. Black commons and commoning might be thought of as premised on the earth as a different kind of practice in its own right. Specifically, it's premised on earth itself as a practice, a material process of movement in differential commoning. This is a movement of matter slash mattering beyond property and propertization. I'm interested then in the religiosity, no, the para-religiosity of this movement in differential comedy. I'm interested in the kinesis of it all, the kinesthetics of it all, the flow of it all, the resonance of it all, the flow of the matter of the earth, where the earth itself is thought of as, shall we say, a way station in the grander flow of the matter of the cosmos as such. What if Black comedy, what if Blackness suggests a different planetary paradigm, a different cosmology? What if it supposes or advances for us to think about a theory of the earth that is premised on a different imagination of matter? Entertaining these questions invites us to entertain another. What if Blackness's relationship, what is Blackness's relationship then to the deep history of the earth? And what if Black comedy, what if Blackness is in fact a summons to become then what we are, the earth, of the earth, with the earth, and thus to be with each other otherwise? What if it's a summons to be, strictly speaking, earthlings? This is to ask what if Blackness is a distinctive imagination of matter, an imagination that poses an alternative to imaginings of matter premised on property, on the logic and the practice of extraction? What if after Charles Long, we thought Blackness as an imagination of matter in which Blackness is thought of as processes of matter as terrestrialization, Blackness as processes of terrestrialization rather than territorialization, processes, processes of becoming earth rather than matter within the terms, within the terms of the world imposed on top of the earth. I don't know if any of this is making sense. I'm sort of trying to talk it out as, I'm, as I was writing this out and I'm reading it, but I wanna think the black commons and I wanna think with my colleague in study, Sarah Servanek's black gathering and the churchicality of such gathering. And I wanna think about black study in terms of a para-religious cosmology of territorialization, celestialization, in which blackness signals matter as an ongoing process of the material flows of cosmic resonances. What long reinterpreting black religion called an alternative imagination of matter, what he also called drawing on the figure of the ellipse in geometry, the ellipsis, the ongoingness, and with Denise Ferreira da Silva, what we might think of as entanglement in refusal of capitalism's practices of sexuation, in refusal of what she also calls the patriarch form. And what again, after Charles Long, I've recently thought about or theorized under the rubric of the anarchy of black religion, and that I might adapt here to call the anarchy of the black commons and of black comedy, the anarchy of blackness as signaling a cosmology of commoning indifference. This commoning is gathering, Black gathering. This commoning is a churchicality, even if it's not of a dogmatic reading of church. It is the movement of an itinerant we-ness, a practice of cosmic we-ing. This is an imagination of matter mattering otherwise. Thank you. Um. So much to talk about. Um, let me give you, though, the four of you, before we open the floor, let me give the four of you a, a chance to just chat for a little bit um, and pick up any threads that you noticed, ask each other some questions. You know, one of my other hats is I directed our Ghana Study Abroad program for a decade. So I've taken probably 300 people uh, across West Africa. And when we go, we start in the villages. So we, you know, 
land in the city in Accra, the capital city, uh, just to get our bearings. And then we're off into, we start in the Volta region uh, with the Eve people uh, who trace their lineage across the Sahel all the way to East Africa. Uh, that's how they got to West Africa. Uh, and so a lot of what they talk about in terms of the world and worldview and uh, mindset really matters. And it grounds a lot of our students who are coming, you know, most people who went with us never even had a passport until they um, went to Ghana. Um, and a lot of people have different perceptions of what that means, but it became very clear that the vocabulary was really important. Uh, and that the worldview was really important. And so uh, from the Eve people to the Ga who are mostly in and around Accra to the Shanti around Kumasi, uh, to the Fanti who are Cape Coast and Elmina in the Western region on the way to uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, there are commonalities, but that's sort of a common ground is, is worldview and, and, uh, and language and vocabulary and knowing one's position in the world such that when you're making decisions, it's spiritually grounded, culturally grounded, uh, and, you know, in their belief systems, you know, about 90% of the world is invisible, right? It's a really interesting belief system, which is uh, we've been, you know, conditioned and trained to make decisions about the world we experience based on our depth of understanding and the material qualities of it that we've learned through through uh, Ms. Perry's presentation, Mr. Car uh, Mr. Carter, Ms. Uh, Servnet, um, that it doesn't align with a lot of what's been discussed in terms of black commons, in terms of the, the constraints that it forces you in immediately when you start to deal with just 10% of the world, essentially, which is the material thing that you can express. So, you know, and a lot of the common ground and a lot of those belief systems is an unbroken connection between the, uh, the ancestors and the unborn. And so we're just sort of this split in the middle, but it's this continuous cycle that's governed by forces that are beyond our understanding. Um, and so, you know, it, it's an interesting place as well, because that is, you know, for uh, recent Portuguese, you know, that's first European contact in West Africa. And so you see immediately, you know, that settler colonial indigenous project on that side of the ocean before it even came uh, to where we are and where we're speaking to you today. So what I'm hearing in the conversation is the continuance of that redefinition, uh, that evolution of language, of a vocabulary, of asserting that uh, when we think of land, that when we think about it just solely for material purposes, uh, we are probably missing 90% of what it really means and what it's about. And so then the question becomes agency. How do you uh, impact and affect and attack those structures that keep us on the 10% and not the 90%. And I would say as a teach and practice landscape architecture, that's, that's a quandary for us. Uh, and one of the reasons why we started to look at historical precedent, at least in the last 200 years, was there were a lot of decisions that uh, black people, and we could talk about black too. So we didn't get into utility and usefulness to the term black, uh, so maybe another symposium, but the idea that uh, formerly enslaved African people had a lot of choices uh, that they could have made um, when they had that ability, you know, so the early days of reconstruction, what most people did is they went in search of their loved ones that they were separated from uh, due to cruel uh, uh, inhumane practices by plantation owners selling off children, wives, that sort of thing. So there's this huge migration across uh, the United States where people want to reunite with their families. Second thing they do is they want property and they want land. And that is the project that's difficult because as the way it's being framed in this conversation, uh, those restrictions are definitely limiting our sense of what's required for liberation. I agree and support that. But the lessons from at least the ancestors from the last 200 years has been a subversive lesson, a lesson of within the systems of control and power, how to carve out niches where freedom is possible. Uh, and that has required some negotiation with very narrow constrained notions of property and ownership. And so in the presentations, I hear that 
imperative, which is we got to get past that. Uh, but uh, to be black in America uh, is it's it's that continuing struggle that from first contact now that we don't all see the world the same way. We don't have the mindset it becomes a power situation, and then in the situation where there's unequal power, you know how do you for when you can you know uh, create boundaries to create space for people to to move and to act. So one of the things that really uh, struck me. Um, in some of my own work is how a lot of the property and land, um, just in terms of the land that African-Americans own, actually did not hold any value in the sense of um, it's being productive land, right? So I've been asked on many occasions, how do I get out of the, the, this um, conundrum around one um, indigenous mass, indigenous dispossession, like how do we grapple with the violence of that. And I would also like to add and say that it's really the violence and colonization and what brings us together in some ways is how violence has shaped our collective identities, how violence have given, um, given our differences great meaning, right? So I think that's really important. But in terms of um, land, I think it's important. I think um, what Cameron um, hinted at is this preoccupation with resource sharing um, but understanding that um, much of the land that the boys and others have documented, um, while many were preoccupied with producing their own food and growing their own food and building new communities and imagining a world anew on lands that were owned and developed by, by Black people um, here and elsewhere, um, much of the land wasn't always considered to be productive, quote unquote, in the capitalist sense, right? And I think partly what do we do with that? And I've argued, that it's a, it's a preoccupation with, as I said, a certain kind of belonging, a sense of not being forced again to move and being pushed elsewhere um, and having to go someplace else, right? I think that's really, and, and this image even of the Haitian migrant, and so I think it seems so important is moving back and forth between Mexico and the United States. And one of the reporters um, this morning on NPR said in, in one of the interviews, the, um, they were talking about how they were moving back and forth to get resources from Mexico, even as they were living in these makeshift spaces in the United States. So I think it's something for us to really start to think about what this ownership is about, there's a, and even what the return to Africa is about on the part of Rastafari and many others, there's a sense of what does it mean to belong, right? What does it mean to land and not being forced to move once again, right? They basically be forced on the run, right? Whether it be in Quilombos, Palenques, maroon societies, et cetera. What does it mean not to be forced to Canada um, and so forth? So I think that some, what, what does it mean not to be forced into a prison? Um, as we know, a significant portion of the black population in the United States can't move because of how the carceral system, and either they're incarcerated in prisons, but also, or they're living the aftermath of having been incarcerated, right? So I think, um, so they actually are incarcerated in the places and being, and, and being limited to how they move around cities or even uh, outside of states, et cetera. I would love to hear what anyone else has to, to say about that, but I, I appreciate this um, formulation of kind of a terrestrialization, I think if I can say the word right, um, Cameron, um, that there's a sense, there's a preoccupation with really finding, you know, your place in the sun, your land, putting your feet in the sand, <laughs> you know, I think mm -hmm. as, as African descendant people. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll only add um, just as a very minor footnote to these wonderful comments. It, one of the things that came to mind for me was this question of the relationship between land and property. That it strikes me that land and property um, are not the same thing, though in some sense, um, within a kind of racial capitalist order, those things tend to be alighted in the direction of property, though. And I'm hoping that one of the things that I'm trying to suggest in my own work is that that effort to rend land from the regime of property, to rend land from the regime of property and therefore, therefore from practices of forced dispossession, so to speak, um, at stake in, in that is a whole nother imagination of the cosmos, of, of cosmology. What does it mean to actually be with the earth? Um, I'm on the board of the Black Land Loss Prevention Project that's uh, directed by Savi Horn. Uh, we've had long conversations about the detail, but that reflects these different 
mindsets, worldviews, you know, clashing still today, and that's air rights, air property rights. So uh, in this country, all the real estate laws and rules work uh, if there's a single landowner. And uh, what ends up happening, one of the drivers of land loss in Black communities, particularly in the rural South, uh, has been uh, the era of Jim Crow uh, and just general uh, racial violence, uh, people not writing wills, not filing them in county courthouses, uh, the federal government not defending people's rights to be able to do that, to be able to participate, just like white people essentially in terms of protecting their land rights. And so when they pass away, a portion of that land goes to each living heir uh, uh, that, that is a descendant of that original landowner. And unless they all pay taxes and they all agree on the next uh, development or the next change happens on that land, it's very easy for someone to come in and just take it. And what Savi talks about, uh, which I have observed and I agree is uh, that idea of property, land is property, uh, belonging to all of your heirs. Uh, that forward looking generational point of view comes from their precedents in indigenous communities, but definitely from West Africa culturally. Um, and so this is where that the, the conflict in these worldviews perpetuates uh, the problem, right? That culturally, do we want to conform to this idea of land as property and therefore align uh, with uh, those codes in order to protect the ownership? Or do we push the other way and say, no, those codes and those rules need to change to embrace you know, a different cultural perspective? One of the things that um, I think is really important that you're seeing, I'm seeing um, a lot lately is um, articles about black gardening practices and ways of relating to land that aren't necessarily about ownership or about dispossession, but about these sort of other temporalities of being with earth and with, and with the possibility of growth um, and making something that, that suggests. There's a phrase that the Caribbean scholar Michaelin, Michaelin Critchlow says, which is about making place. And one makes place from what is at your disposal now, both conservative and progressive methodologies, right? So if, if, the, if the space of commoning, the theory of commoning might be able to hold a more mixed hybrid perspective, I was curious to see what you might think about that. I think about it in, in some respects between two figures. On the one hand, I think about it between Glissant and Poetics of Relation. And on the other hand, I think about it in relationship to Sylvia Winter. What Glissant helps us think about is relation as a, a kind of creolization. And it's sort of like what property does, it wants to interdict relation creolization. Property doesn't come first. Well, this question is a little bit more, if I could just hear y'all talk a little bit more about a thread I kind of heard between everybody's 10 minutes was the kind of language of imagination. Well, you know, oh, I was thinking about, I've been thinking about like um, the question of resources, like um, in relationship, like black women writers who've long talked about the poetic as a resource, right? Um, and for example, June Jordan, there's a conversation with June Jordan um, and Alexis DeVoe where she talks about that she hopes that people find in her poet, this is a paraphrase, um, <laughs> that she hopes that people find in her poetry something like a decent breakfast. Um, and so what does it mean to, like what role um, does the poetic play in something like sustenance for the activist, right? Who is struggling, like in the case of like Dr. Perry's like, like real, like, Black women, you know, fighters on the line with land grabs, like what role does the poetic, right? What role does the dream, right? Um, or, the, or, or the arts play in creating another um, terrain, right? To imagine resource, to imagine sustenance, right? Like the possibilities that the page engenders that um, what was actual 
um, couldn't real, be realized, if that makes sense. Like, can the page extend um, um, the ground on which people stand, right? And in what way? And um, even if it's just for a tiny bit. I think it's important for us to realize that property, or more precisely, propertization is an imagination. It then passes itself off as a common sense. The reason that's important because then imagination becomes the terrain of a counter interdiction back, right? It becomes it becomes the locus of a kind of you know, um, um, of, a, of a practice of an alternative, right? The, the imagination has to be colonized in order for a, a series of other colonization imaginative colonizations to flow out of it. And so the key thing was that the, the, the um, those who were colonized. Um, were indicted, as it were, of having problematic imaginations to matter precisely because they understood matter as a scene of relationality. For me, what, what the discourse of the sacred does, what um, aesthetic practices do, the whole notion of a different relationship to the page is about, is all about, in many respects, releasing the imagination from the ways in which it's been directed to only go in a kind of propertizing direction. Now, as I think about it, that's ultimately what's at stake in kind of black performance practices. That's what's at stake, you know, in um, black artistic practices. And finally, I would argue as well, um, and it needs to be argued, <laughs> and I'm, I'm contributing to those arguments, that's what's at stake in what is called black religion. That's what's at stake. It's not this dogmatic stuff. Black religion is a part of the aesthetic practices of the release of the imagination from property logics. I wanted to ask you all more about the Black and the Black commons, just because like the, pro the, the different um, ideas of interdiction like that Jay was talking about um, that are, are causing these separations from uh, humanity and uh, the natural, the sacred and the relational I feel like in different, obviously, like neo-colonial situations um, in the diaspora, um, certain like chocolate city formations here in the US, you have claims made to something like the Black Commons that are really on, uh, for the purpose of extraction um, and propertization by a kind of Black elite. Um, although I admire, you know, Du Bois greatly, um, he's an super elitist, right? had a theory of change that, that he professed called the talented 10. Right? So, you know, you don't invest in everybody. You know, you are seeking out who he thought kind of met the bar and you resource them and that's their responsibility to drag everybody up. Right? Uh, what we can see is that's a really problematic theory of change, right? The opposite, which a lot of people talk about now, stuff like Adrian Lee Brown's work you know, emergent strategy, you know, in some ways connected to uh, legacy family Hamer and a lot of the, I think the important theoretical contributions, real contributions by feminists particularly, um, that uh, uh, the theory of change has changed uh, or is changing. Uh, but I think that in terms of how black operates in that space, I mean, from a racial capitalist standpoint, black means nothing, um, it is an othering uh, for the dehumanization and exploitation of a group of people. So racial capitalism existed before the definition of black and white, right? In Europe, white people were exploiting one another, just as bad as they exploited black people in America before they even got here, right? So uh, this idea of black as a racial category is, is, is challenged. However, the adaptation, the cultural adaptations required to create the space to uh, develop some notion of freedom and autonomy and, and, uh, and passion and love um, is in resistance to that. So there's a whole nother definition of it that's cultural, that's about resistance to, to that exploitation. With regards to the Chaka City phenomenon, I'm a native of Detroit, Michigan. So I know a lot of people talk about Michigan or Washington DC or uh, Newark, New Jersey, or other places of Chaka City, I'm here to tell you there was only one, <laughs> and that was Detroit in its heyday. But I think that had that reveals sort of the challenge where uh, 
you know, the reason why Black people were drawn to cities like Detroit and Chicago and other places in the Great Migration was uh, uh, Henry Ford and other people trying to break uh, labor unions that were dominated by white folks with the $5 day and with what we were today called scabs, like uh, strike breakers to exclusively black people from Mississippi and Alabama. So for the economic opportunity afforded an escape from Jim Crow uh, in the South, they faced a whole nother set of conditions in the North. So even as the wealth accumulation and the property accumulation, all these other things sort of occurred, it was always in this huge bubble of, of exploitation. And there's a more common or, or current story about go-go music in Washington, DC. Although I grew up in Detroit, my family's from the Southeast, from Anacostia. Uh, Washington, D.C., uh, where in gentrification, people coming in and the uh, cultural practice of people blasting go-go music, which is, you know, an icon of uh, Washington, D.C., and people complaining about it, noise violations, you know, trying to get Black-owned businesses and Black homes, you know, censured for all kinds of things with the hope of deterring them from continuing that cultural practice and, and hopefully getting out of there so it can turn into a white community. Uh, were the triggers for a broader coalition of black folks, not the Du Boises, but everybody, uh, to say no, we're gonna we're gonna resist, and uh, you know this, these are things that are important, and you need to find your place uh, if you decide to live here and engage with us. There's rules to this uh, that are cultural, not racial, cultural uh, that that you need to adapt to. So I think with regards to the Black Commons, there's a complexity with regards to blackness, right? It's, uh, it's this tenuous relationship with do you edify and support this really flawed notion of race. You brought up Gail Jones at several points during this conversation and many of my students are here with whom I read um, Carigadora last year and was once again completely unsettled by that text and the way that it um, sort of unmakes the form of the, the novel. So maybe just thinking about Jones and form and what's happening with language and sound. And you said earlier, Jones has been earthing and can the page amend the ground on which people stand? And I really love that formulation. So maybe you could talk more about that. And I know that it's in the book too. So I know I use this quote all the time and I, I use it in the intro to my book. And, but there's, I'm just, she has this line, everything said in the beginning must be said better than in the beginning in Corrigadora and it's about what it's about and it's it's not about what it's about so in in other words like it's a story about a relation among women right um enslaved black women um living under the compulsion to reproduce and never forget um the violences of enslavement but it's also because so much of what jones i think does in Corrigadora, i think also um in song for in nino is think about um, the sexual violation of Black women in relation to earthly violation. Um, and I also think that Jones is interested in um, how language itself can be the site for this alternative imagination where both Black women and earth are released from forms of subjection. Um, the the, pers the personae that are both present and not present, but are hinted at like that, you know, when, when um, Ursa's on the bus, right? And the people come to her in a dream, but they're never named. She, like, she's literally peopling her novel, like her, pe like her novels are commons, right? And um, they're communities. And, and she even says like, I learned to write through listening. So writing, writing for Jones has always been multiple, right? As opposed to this like kind of singular idea of authorship, right? Um, and also, you know, which is never far kind of like in the history of sort of, you know, consensual of philosophy from ideas of like self-possession and, and, and sort of sovereign singularity, right? Jones is always, Jones arrives to the page multiply, right? So that you know, and she said, that's how I learned to write is through listening. And so already, even in that sentence, it's a gesture of like, like the sentence is a commons, right? Um, of people named and unnamed. People also forget that Sylvia Winter was a playwright and an ethnographer, right? Um, and a lot of those ideas is what has now generated 
um, the brilliant thought that she um, that is now being cited. Um, and I and it just and that's another note about why ethnographers are written out of these conversations on thought. So, but thank you so much for your question. So the sentence is a commons. Um, might be a, might be as good a way to end as 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 we can think of. Um, it, it's it's three twelve. We we promise to end at three ten. Um, so um, we can we can thank in the way that we all are all now used to doing on Zoom um, our presenters. Thank you all so much. Um, this was uh, we we could have kept going for a long time, um, and that's a mark of a really good conversation, which I hope in various forms and various permutations will continue. Um, now, what we can't all do is go to the bar, um, which, is, <laughs> which is the thing we, that would, we would really enjoy doing. Um, so we'll just have to say goodbye. But thank you again very much. And thanks to our audience for being here. Take care, everybody.